Good luck. I really have. Hi, I'm Ted Nelson. I have a rule. I'm going to read. You know. I have a rule. <laughs> Don't tell people too many ideas at once. Now I'm going to go against it. I'm telling my main ideas in profusion to gather them briefly for reference. Might as well do it now. I'm getting old. I'm going to do much, much less since my wife Marlene died in 2015. Now I'm concentrating on my archives and trying to be understood. Can I see it? Like everyone, I want to be understood and appreciated, but also because my work has been considered significant. Um, I come across, like, yeah, I, I come across as self-important because I want people to understand me, I'm very unusual. As Orson Welles used to say, you'll love me when I'm dead. Here's a book called Intertwingled, the, the cover of it. Intertwingled, the work and influence of Ted Nelson. It's from Springer Verlag, publishing company. The one with the cover will cost you 60 bucks, but you can download the book for free. It's all, it's all very nice stuff about my work. You need to understand that I'm not like other people, because my head is boiling with ideas and visualizations all the time, much faster than other people. I have ideas for too fast for people to keep up with. Is this a disease? It would be if the ideas weren't good, but they've influenced many people. Some of them have been important, uh, or at the same time, as other people. Uh, pardon me. Some of them have been important because I had them early in the 1960s. I had a lot of significant ideas first or at the same time as other people. One, I'll start with movies. Movies were my life as a boy. Disney especially, but a lot of foreign films. All my life I wanted to make movies. In college I made one and I said, that's who I am, I'm a filmmaker. But I didn't have a chance to go on. Two, then there was language. Mine was a very literary family. We talked all the time about words and connotations and writing. My great-grandfather recited poetry at the table. He was a science teacher. I had no idea there was a distinction between science and, and literature, especially because of his great poem about evolution. It's called Our Life, a Modern Requiem. It's on the Internet Archive in his book, Harvest of the Year. It's wonderful. It, it, it's to be read by several people. So if this love of language, so this love of language led to number three, linguistics. My second year in college, I took a linguistics course. It was thrilling. It answered so many questions about language. Structural linguistics led to my philosophy, which we'll get to. What was structural linguistics? The study of language as structures, the pieces and relationships of a language. The pieces of a language all had new names in the field of structural linguistics. I took this course at the University of Pennsylvania with a professor named Zelig Harris. He was also Chomsky's teacher, but I won't go into that. <clears throat> so, Professor Zelig Harris signed me a book on how to analyze a language quickly. It's phonemes, it's morphemes, <clears throat> and deeper than words, and it's grammatical structure. What's a phoneme? The sound of a language that a speaker recognizes. So the phonemes of another language will sound, may sound completely alien to you, but they're familiar to a speaker of that language. What's a morpheme? It's a set of phonemes with meaning, not just a word, because ing in English, ing is a morpheme, but it isn't a word. It can only be attached, so that's called a bound morpheme. I found this thrilling, not just what I learned about language, but what I learned about finding structure. In any field, the problem is finding its true structure, what scientists do already, but thought of in a different way. Structural linguistics seem to apply a way of finding the true structure and relations in a domain. And I wanted to generalize that. That brings us to philosophy. So four, number four, philosophy. <clears throat> my, my major in college. I cared about philosophy. In high school, I'd already been interested in philosophy. At 16, I called myself a poet, philosopher, and a rogue. In college, I loved my philosophy courses. And my third year, I tried to expand on what I'd learned in linguistics. How they'd abstracted everything out of language, to, out of all languages, to find the discrete structures of phonemes, morphemes, and tagmemes. I tried to generalize this. How do we find true structure? And how represent it? These issues are at the heart of science and cognition. Every description is structural. How do we perceive, abstract, and describe? I call this general schematics. I wanted to represent everything as discrete relations. I call a structural description a schematic. I call a rule structure a normat. The same system of structural representation could be applied to strategy, a structural representation of strategy, of of maneuvers of situations. 
I later studied strategy under the great Tom Schelling, who said I was his favorite student. <clears throat> this representation of discrete structures was being invented at the same time by others as the semantic net. So this philosophy of general schematics has gripped me all my life. I've repeatedly tried to pull it together from my thousands of notes. Over the years, I've written this as half a dozen books. There's a huge pink manuscript on the Internet Archive. I just found another book I wrote on it in 1982. I kept on writing about schematics, wrote many versions. I could never let it go. Finally, one version was finished and published my PhD thesis. You can get it at Lulu, you can get it at Lulu or Amazon. <clears throat> okay, let's bring these different concerns together. We combine some of these concerns, moving, writing, and structure, into my computer explosion of 1960, and the things I thought of either first or at the same time as other people. Remember, I thought I was a filmmaker, but I was also a writer and a structuralist. When I understood the computer in the fall of 1960, I went crazy. I had so many ideas, ways of representing data, but especially about representing ideas. We've had paper documents for so long. <clears throat> What would we have in the new computer era? As a filmmaker, I realized that the interactive screen, perhaps there were a hundred there were a hundred total in the world at that time, would be the new home of the human rights. I had never seen one, but I didn't need to. And when I first sat in, at an interactive screen, I wept. I think that was 1967. <coughs> well, because it was just as I had imagined. So as a writer, I wanted new ways of writing. Thus began my computer work, leading to the hypertext concept and many structures to support hypertext over the years. I've had many software design ideas, especially connected documents and new forms of writing. Most important, the Xanadu designs and the new form of writing that were made possible. I had several valid inventions, working with Cal Daniels in the early 1970s, that went into the Xanadu project. How would we visualize these new forms of writing? My simplification has been to keep the sequential text to create powerful bridges between them. Still my standard model, you can see demos in my video. The Xanadu project reached its high points <clears throat> in 1979 with the great Xanadu design by Roger Gregory et al., described in my book Literary Machine, and almost ready ahead of the web. And the other high point was Rob Smith's Xanadu space in 2004 and on. I think he did 50 versions till he had to quit. It's a beautiful demo but could not be prioritized. These are shown in the YouTube videos called Xanadu Basics 1A and Xanadu Basics 2. In the classic version, Xanadu had a copyright doctrine and a micropayment system for publishers who want to charge for content. It is designed for a complete literary system and possible commerce. This was entirely implemented in Japan as the, quote, hyper-transaction system under Professor Ohiwa <coughs> at Keio University, sponsored by Miti. See Xanadu Basics 2. I've continued to move along with the Xanadu concept in different variations, especially to support visible connections between pages. I still continue that with the wonderful Edward Betts in England. Marlene and I also did a micropayment system, Hypercoin, sponsored by Kazuhika Nishi. Intended to support the idea, sometimes it was hypermint, sometimes it was hypergold. I've designed other screen visualizations, notably the zigzag universe of multidimensional structures, implemented several times. And oh yes, the visualization of time as a spiral, which I call spiral time, implemented by Kenichi and Unai in VRML, now lost. It has a number of interesting properties, closing the spiral and seeing, uh, uh, seeing uh, repetitions, uh, having multiple spirals spinning out for a talent center and so on, and being able to annotate the different point, uh, Cells in the spiral. However, not happening. So what about the theory of software design? Of course, I had a lot to say about that. I've lectured about it a lot, but unfortunately, I never had time to publish. However, I put onto the Internet Archive, never published on paper, Cinema of the Mind, The Art of Software Design, a book I prepared for a seminar in 1994. And I just found a book I wrote in 1969 on software design for the screen. It might have had an impact if it, it published then, but it was lost in the computer at Brown University. So that's a quick rundown of my computer ideas. In other areas, I've been called a sociologist. I've just, I've, I just have one original theory about human life, 
from my studies in the social sciences, I came up with one big idea, my theory of biostatics, of human morale, effectiveness and depression is not just based on hormones, but is an evolved system. You'll find that on the Internet Archive under the title, The Secret of Human Life. I have no time to talk about my musical songs and poetry. So, running it all by you, so, there's a, so at least there's a common list of what I think I've thought of. Uh, now I can take questions if in the time that remains. Any showing? Show him. All right. So if you do have time, you can talk about your list of songs and poetry. Well, I've written a few good poems. Here's one I wrote for Marlene. It was published in the Oxford Magazine, or one of the Oxford Magazines in 2016. Don't go back to the other because the feedback here is it's killing me. Oh, all right, I'll write, I'll write the poem. It's called Homing. The spermatozoan had little to go on, tunneling into the mist, but a faraway flavor to seek and to savor of spices contrived for the tryst. Her chemical gradient, welcoming, radiant, summoned, her to his, summoned him to her embrace, just as something between us, some beacon of Venus, has beckoned me here to this place where you open for me, receive me, adore me, how hither came I who can tell? Like each nano ancestor who finding her and blessed her, I've followed so blindly, so well. Anyway, that's that's probably the best poem. Somebody who wants to uh, expand on your spiral of time theory. Hmm. It's not a theory, it's a design. Can I talk about it? What about it? <coughs> You have, if for example, so conventional representation of time is in little calendars or little clocks. Hello, <laughs> clock emphasizes the hour and and eight hour and, and twenty four hour cycle. The calendar emphasizes the week and the month cycle and the year. Hey, time is a huge continuum. It also gets very small. So why are we representing these two subsets? So if you represent time as a circle, as a spiral, let's say we're going to represent a year, a number of years. Let's see if I can draw this spontaneously. Okay, so I drew it rather badly. But if this is if this is January first, yeah. <laughs> sorry, if this is January first of this year, next one is January first of last year, or next year, January first, and then this is March first, June first, September first, uh, October first. <clears throat> so those are now these are the individual days. But suppose we put in the full moons. So the full moons are a spiral which spirals inward because, have I got it right? No, it should be the other way. I'm sorry. It should be the other way. I believe that the spiral of full moons goes this way because the, the uh, lunar month is shorter. And so here we represent the cycle of the month, the years, the days, and we can also put in things like the moon cycle, lunar cycle, and see its representation by comparison with the other. So it's a, it's a graph with considerably more information than you can get in regular little clocks or calendars. So that's the, uh, now you could of course have, if you spiral it out, let's see. You can have, you can have it spiraling out different ways we have it spiraling out different ways to represent, for example, different um, granularities of time. Uh, but anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a huge realm of possibility. Uh, 
I will not be exploring. Is that, is that today? This is, uh, yeah, this is a question. Okay, I'd like to hear more stories about my friendship with Douglas Engelbart. And I'd like to talk about that right now. So, I first met Doug Engelbart in September of 1966 when I came to California. I, I heard about him after my first talk at the ACM when I talked about uh, text on screens. Uh, Bob Taylor came up to me. Bob Taylor was Doug's sponsor at the time. And said, asked if I heard of Douglas Engelbart. I said, no. So I wrote it down and made a, and vowed to meet him. So the next year, I managed to get out to California and uh, visit his laboratory. So this was two years before the great demo on December 9th, 1968. So I saw the mouse. I saw multiple windows on the screen. I saw, I saw many things working. I thought Doug was a wonderful guy. He had a fabulous lab. Uh, I was trying to at my own lab at Harcourt Brazen World in, in New York, uh, little did I understand that there was no way that could happen because IBM already had a department at Harcourt, and no way would they allow a competitive machine from another manufacturer. IBM did not have screen systems at anything like the prices, the low prices that digital equipment did. But anyway, so I, I got to see Doug at that time. Didn't see him again for years. Uh, when I moved to California, well, no, it's for, for, on some occasion, Beauvais and Rhodes had me interview him for his uh, for, for for their magazine. He, he was in, chem, in chemotherapy, chemotherapy at the time. He had cancer, but he got well from that. And then when I moved to California in 1988, uh, my 51st birthday was on a houseboat, and Doug and his wife Ballard came, and that made the occasion. It's really one, well, a lot of things. <laughs> but it was, it was a wonderful time. And um, since then, we kept up. I put him in my little movie called Silicon Valley Story, which you can see on YouTube, <coughs> playing my father. Um, and in the, in the ensuing years, we got to see a lot of each other. Stayed at his house in, in, in uh, Atherton a number of times. And uh, alas, when he lost... When he lost his uh, his wife Ballard, it was roughly the same time that my mother lost her uh, fourth husband Wesley Addy, and Marlene and I got the funny idea of getting them together, and we tried to get the hold of Dayton, which my mother was interested in. My mother was an actress, was interested in Doug, but he didn't get it, and uh, and uh, he waited, and then, then he found Karen Engelbart, later Karen Engelbart, who was a wonderful supportive person and could give him all of her time, which my mother certainly could not have. And uh, alas, we were in family lawsuits at the same time. I won't discuss that. His, his daughters sued because they thought Karen was a gold digger after his money, and she was not. I won't talk about my own. Um, and then over the years, I got to see, can see him considerably more staying in Atherton. And then when it looked like Doug was not long for this world. Marlene finally consented to marry me. And uh, that was in 2012. We had a lovely ceremony. Yeah, right. What? Privacy connection issues. Were we connected? Did we lose a whole lot? No. No. So okay, I think you're good. I'm good. To, so, so there was a gap. Do we know where the gap was? Um, I'd say no. We don't know the gap. Okay. Well, talking about Douglas Engelbart, what I was saying is that, that finally Marlene consented to marry me when when uh, Doug was failing, and uh, so our wedding ceremony is on YouTube with Doug and Carol, Karen Engelbart marrying Marlene Ted, Malico, Ted Nelson at the Marin, the Marin County Civic Center, which is a wonderful place. Frank Lloyd Wright's best building, I think, and a great place to get married. Other things about Doug, he was 
incredibly sweet. As I have a eulogy for him. After he died in 2013, I uh, gave a talk at the Computer History Museum. Now, alas, after his great demo in 1968, December 9, 1968, he lost all his funding. And so for, for the rest of his working life, he was out in the cold. Fortunately, he got a salary of all things from Logitech, which out of gratitude for inventing the mouse, since he had no royalties on it. <clears throat> and he managed to get by and get numbers of different jobs, but he was always hoping, always hoping, like me. He was always hoping, and uh, and uh, one day when, 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 when Karen and, and Doug went to London, they... Uh, he got so excited to be in London that he had to stay in the hotel room to write specs. <laughs> I understand that. He's being, being energized, high biostatus, being energized with high biostatus, and got to do something. And that was done. He, he always believed, and he always went on hoping it would work. Any other questions for me? Question about trans copyright mm. you mentioned PGP and blockchain. But well, trans copyright is, shall we say, a uh, an orphan concept. It's perfectly valid legally. It just isn't in use because things are copied so freely, and so you never know where a thing comes from. Under trans copyright, you give a part. You, trans copyright was mated to a possible payment system, but not necessarily. So when you, if you give trans copyright permission, you say you may include any amount of this content, provided that you only provide, that you only give a pointer to it, and the user downloads it from my server. So that would allow for uh, micropayment on that content. Uh, people, have, some people have objected to the idea of micropayment. Well, hey, we pay for books, right? I mean, the point was to create a valid system of commerce. And under, trans, under, under this system, A, publishers didn't have to charge for content. I had no intention of making that mandatory. But if you didn't pay for the section that, was, that had a royalty paywall, you just wouldn't get that part. But the point being that it's low, pay, low cost and quotable in any amount without specific negotiation, and always comes from the original, so you can, the user, the downloader, can see the original context. It was a broad spectrum solution to a class of, to a number of different problems which are not solved in the prevailing methods today. Anything else? All right. Uh, advice on how do you think of interesting ideas contrary to popular perspectives in the past? How do you get people to entertain new ideas? I don't know. The problem is to be able to think and imagine. And, but also, how to make, make these ideas to possible mechanisms. So I've always tried to find mechanisms for implementing the stuff that I wanted to do, and I've gone to the people who knew how to do it and found one mechanism, another mechanism, another mechanism, another mechanism, time and again. Because, so, there's a, uh, there was a personality test that they gave me at uh, Data Point, and it said I was a producer-director type. I didn't know there was such a type, but my father was a producer-director. And so I guess I am, meaning that you put together the parts and go to the people who can do the, who can do the job. And, uh, and that's my, been my approach. I've been a producer-director of software. So was Doug Engelbart. He didn't do the programming. So was Steve Jobs. He didn't do the programming. And point about the reason Apple stuff was so good at the beginning was that Steve Jobs was a movie director, intrinsically. He knew the user's feelings, whereas in today's software, nobody's in charge. They, they delegate, quote, user experience to a small box, but different portions of a system are given to different people, so there's no overall control of the system. No overall control of how it seems. And if you make a movie, somebody's got to direct it. And, and software is a movie. 
So for his events on the screen that affect the hearts and minds, affect the hearts and minds of the viewer, just as movies, a movie's affect events on the screen that affect the heart and mind of the viewer. So what does software add? Interaction and consequences. It's a movie with interaction and consequences. So it needs a director in the same way that a movie director needs a director, but there's no such job description. Many people would be willing to step up to the plate. However, the same, in, same as in Hollywood, everybody wants to direct. The real question is who's got the talent, but worse in this case, who's got the authority. And in today's software world, nobody has the authority to control the overall feeling and appearance, except occasionally the independent software developer who can do it himself or herself. But that's now a rare thing. And so all these things are done by teams with the parts delegated and the overall interaction, the overall gestalt, the overall feeling of the system, totally out of control. And software keeps getting worse. Why? Because things keep getting added and nothing is taken away. Now, before you had movies, you had newspapers. And the editor of a newspaper would choose what stories to put in what columns. And if you added a column, something had to get taken away. <laughs> if you add to a movie, given a certain timeline, something has to be taken away. But in software, they keep adding things and nothing is taken away, so it gets more and more complicated, more and more filled with crud. More and more messy. So software always gets worse now, and there's nothing to be done for it. Any more questions? No. Uh, if people are interested in uh, some heading up in direction, how would they reach out to you? <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm available, but not for free. <laughs> a lot of people send me their software to look at it. So, no way. I have no time to look at it, critique. No way to study it. But I'm available as a consultant, as a software director, but then it's very hard to get the authority to direct software because people who understand, who, who make the parts go around feel that it is their right to control how it looks. And this is unfortunate. This is, um, let's see, let's put it this way. Most programmers do not understand how most people think. And that is true for People who create apps, people who create, people who work at the major companies, because they just keep adding stuff and the menus keep getting bigger. Nobody gets to say, okay, here's the package, here's what we're going to leave out, here's what we're going to put here on the menu. So remember that the menu design, the menu flex itself, is a system of effects and a system of, con of constructs which need to be understood by the user. For example, oh, well, as I said, Apple certainly is not the way it was under Jobs. Yeah. Trying to make the, change the size of the cursor the other night, I finally went to Google and said, you, know, you go to something, something like accessibility, and the changing the size of the mouse was under displays under accessibility. Hello? It makes no sense at all. Designing the menu structure to make sense is the only part of making software make sense. There's an echo in this one. Um, no other direct questions. No other direct questions. Well, always. <laughs> yeah. I can talk about the Great Internet Archive. We're sitting at the Internet Archive. The Great Ar Internet Archive is an astounding institution. The lunch is free at noon on Fridays. And the place has a party atmosphere, partly because of the wonderful hospitality of its founder, uh, entrepreneur, Brewster Kale. And uh, it's a marvelous place. He holds events here for the whole of San Francisco. And, uh, and uh, I very much enjoy hanging out here. It's uh, extremely supportive. A lot of energetic, brilliant people doing a lot of hard work. That's on accountability. Accountability? Mm -hmm. For what? Doesn't specify personal accountability? Group accountability? Accountability. Accountability. That's, that's, a, that's a, a loose term. 
how we might achieve accountability. What is it? It's achieve accountability. Is it, is it that? Yeah. I don't know what I mean. I mean, accountability to whom? <laughs> accountability would involves two parties. That person who is challenged to be to be accountable, and that 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 audience, which to whom that person is accountable. And uh, if, if you just say accountability, well, hey, the American government was set up to be accountable to the people for the actions of its uh, elected representatives, of its appointed representatives. And uh, we've sort of lost that, haven't we? And uh, in all governmental situations we encounter bureaucrats, and to whom are they accountable? Not to, not to you, the victim, but to, uh, to, the, to some department where they're being judged according to whether they fulfilled the list of criteria for their job. So uh, there are always, there are different, there, there is no global accountability. Accountability? There's no way. Because anything can be put on the market. Any kind of garbage, and it all is. And, and some of it works and some of it doesn't. It just <clears throat> trying to page through free apps on the web that supposedly cut an MP3, trying to find one that works. You know, <clears throat> those are those are those are free by uh, created apparently by uh, generous people. And then the stuff that's sold, how can it be counted? There's, 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 to whom do you complain? Uh, there's nobody. I mean, you, you can complain to the stars in the sky and your best friend, but it's not going to do any good. You've spent the money and you've loaded the, the system. And of course, if, and if it's a uh, if it's a Wi-Fi and it's reporting back to who knows where or, or, or uh, uh, capturable by uh, alien species. So who's accountable for today's computer world? Nobody. And, and supposedly Microsoft is accountable for its, the problems of its software and Apple is responsible for the problems of its software. Hey, I, I, I've got a three-year-old Mac Mini that's got so many bugs that they've introduced since my 2013 Mac. Um, um, Macintosh Air. I have no idea why they introduce bugs. Uh, and to whom is it? To whom are they accountable? Well, in some vague sense, to I who complain, but I complain to the sun and the stars. So there's no point in complaining to Apple. People ask me, why did I choose the name Xanadu? Because of the Coleridge poem. Coleridge wrote a beautiful poem and uh, supposedly claims to have been interrupted by a person from Porlock, which is a suburb of London, uh, or part of London now. And this person from Porlock kept him occupied, so he had no time to write down the rest of the poem and was forgotten. So now it's just a fragment. And it's his vision of the pleasure palace of Kublai Khan, which is called Xanadu. Now, there is a real Xanadu. The place really exists. And I have a photograph. Back up. Kublai Khan was a great conqueror who conquered much of Asia, tried to conquer Japan, but was twice his fleets were swept aside by a great wind called the Kamikaze by the, uh, by the Japanese, a word later used for other things in World War II. But Kublai Khan, anyway, was a successful emperor, and he had a pleasure palace at a place called Xanadu. Now, the, the current Chinese government says it's at Chengdu, but my pal Rob Smith has found in a satellite photo what looks like exactly the place, and I put it on the Internet Archive, uh, the, the, the photograph. I, I couldn't put it in a YouTube video because it blacked out. But the, 
It looks exactly like the rectangle described by Marco Polo. And so Marco Polo went to this pleasure palace, and it was while reading the travels of Marco Polo that Coleridge wrote his poem. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the great green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place as lonely and enchanted as air beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover, and so forth and so on. Now, this is all fiction, because it, <laughs> there was no sacred river, there, was no, there were no caverns. Those, those were made up by Coleridge. It's a rectangular plot of land with other rectangles, sub-rectangles. But it probably was in the spot that I've put at the Internet Archive. So why did I choose the name? Well, because I wanted Xanadu to be, to be the place of magic literary memory where nothing was forgotten. So Coleridge forgot the poem because it was interrupted. I somehow thought that in the computer age it would be easy to store and retrieve and deliver digital content. I underestimated the problem. I certainly didn't foresee today's political problems with internet censorship. I, I, I foresaw that there would be a net because IBM said there'd be a net. Okay, I said, okay, there'll be a net. But, the problem, but so I wanted to establish Xanadu as a set of storage locations which would run the software that my team was developing. So these storage lo locations I called Xanadu Stands, <laughs> and there's a picture I have of put a picture on the Internet Archive of myself back in, I think, 1987, holding a clay model of a Xanadu stand. So I still believe that I'd be able to create a chain of stands like McDonald's stands that would be the ISPs of the, of the future, holding content and delivering it to people through the Xanadu protocol and the Xanadu network. I kept up that dream a long time. And even in my, in my 1990 lecture in Rome, which is on, the, uh, on YouTube, I said, you know, next year I expect to be in a polyester uniform behind the counter in Xanadu State. So, you know, I did invite the idea of the ISP, I believe, the, the, the place that would store content and deliver it, or uh, I believe I invented it. I was the first independent software developer, not in a company, in 1960. Uh, first of a lot of those. And with a pretty good idea, which had a good run. And it still has a good run in terms of literature of interconnected par parallel pages. So if you want to understand that, please look at Xanadu Basics 1A on YouTube. Thanks for your poems reading. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What other poems should I read? Well, huh. Is there time to pull up? No. What are you doing? Pull up one. Oh, yeah. Wait. Pull up one. Is this a question to me? Yeah. Oh. Do you, do you no. Oh, no, I was going to try and pull up something from from my great-grandfather's poetry on the Internet Archive, but I don't have that. He wrote a wonderful poem called Our Life, a Modern Requiem. I believe it was after my great-aunt Hinda died. I never met her. And uh, it was about evolution. And uh, it was read by four parties called the Animate, the inanimate, something, and the divine. And it's a, it's a wonderful poem, and you'll find it in his book, Harvest of the Years, which is at the Union Archive. Edmund Gale Jewett. He's a great man. He, uh, he invented the method of drying lumber. 
that is in use today, but the, and he patented it, but the lumber companies just used it without paying him. So like me, he wasn't a businessman. And uh, so he became a science teacher, and his book, Smith and Jewett, uh, An Introduction to the Study of Science, is also a theme in it. And there's a picture of him by the, by the barn of our farm that I took when I was 13, which I also posted. So he, and, and, and my grandmother used him as a, uh, as a model for Jesus in her book of Christ drawing, which is also at the Internet Archive. So I've got a lot of family stuff at the Internet Archive. And you just told me story of the Grand Parents. I did have, a, my grandmother had a ticket on the Lusitania. Now, as many of you will know, the Lusitania was torpedoed in 1915. Almost everybody, well, a few, there were some survivors. But she got a telephone call from Arnold Genter, the photographer, who was a friend of hers. said, Gene, I understand you have a ticket on the Lusitania. He said, yes. He said, I'd like you to change to the New York uh, to meet my friend Ellen Terry, the actress. And my grandmother said she wasn't my grandmother at the time, because she wasn't married. She said, oh, no, I, everything is on the Lusitania. He said, I'll arrange everything, said Arnold Genter. So he, she switches to the New York. Her luggage is now on the New York, and she's painting a picture of Ellen Terry, the actress, and she said, you know, Arnold Genta had me change ships to just to meet you. And Ellen Terry said, that's strange. He had me change ships from the Lusitania just to meet you. And then, of course, she was torpedoed. Many think because of Winston Churchill. <coughs> so... Uh, my question was, why was she going to Europe during World War I? And I guess I've figured it out now. She was going to Norway to marry my grandfather, but she stopped off in France and did portraits of, of the president during World War I. But then she married my grandfather. Well, since my, grand, since my mother was born in 1917 during World War I, they must have been married about 1916. So I guess she was on her way to Norway to marry him. But it's, it's, it's still quite convoluted. My grandparents were the finest people I ever knew. My, great -grand my grandfather, Theodore Holm, of Hatcher Holm and Nick, uh, grew up in a place called Hogum le Prestigor, which is on the coast of Norway. That's, it's, that's called the Old Parsonage. And his father was Carinus Theodore Holm, who was the country minister. And that was at the time a government position in the 1890s. And so they, in this stern and rock-bound coast, they had a little house. They had a number of houses, and, uh, and that's where my grandfather was born. I visited there several times. And uh, so my grandfather emigrated to the United States. He did not uh, come through Ellis Island. His sister was already here, his sister Teresa. And so uh, he was able to come through, not through Ellis Island, but just as a first-class passenger. And then he became an insurance executive in New York and uh, was extremely forgiving, kind, understanding, warm, and he was like my father. I, I rarely saw my parents. They were separated before I was born. But I lived with my grandparents, uh, mostly on Washington Square in New York. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, they were wonderful people, very understanding and very kind. Uh, and just as they had done everything they could to foster my mother's talent. She wanted to be an actress. And then my mother left me with them when I was six months old, so they, they had to raise me. And, uh, and they did everything to foster, foster my, power, my talents, which were intellectual. So, uh, and, uh, she also was an artist. She also wrote poetry. She wrote uh, novels and uh, managed to maintain a complicated social life. So she was extremely resourceful. And he supported all of this. At the same time, he supported our family and a number of other people. So these, so as I say, they were very fine people. Theodore Holm, Theodore Holm and, and his wife, Jean. And, uh, and they were very good to me. What can I say? So, not everyone was lucky enough to know their great-grandparents. Uh, that's partly because my great-grandmother Blanche Eugenia Newell was born in 1864 at the end of the Civil War, but uh, her third husband, Edmund 
was much longer. So he lived on until 1965, but I got to know them both very well. Hmm. Anything? Anything coming up? I can just, I can just ramble forever. <laughs> uh, it's fun. I, I enjoy talking more than anything, I suppose. Uh, I don't know what sort of comments or questions might be interesting for future students. I have no idea. I have no idea. There's, you know, uh, I can talk about the past very well. I don't talk about the future because I'm very pessimistic about the future. Uh, Ellsberg thinks Daniel Ellsberg, who I knew at one time, he didn't remember me when I last saw him. But, uh, he helped mediate between Harley and me. And uh, uh, he thinks nuclear war is practically inevitable and all consuming nuclear war because once it starts. And uh, then there's the global warming thing, which means that all the coastal cities will drown and agriculture will be disrupted, and where will all the people move to? And uh, how, will, how will life go on? Quote, organize human life on the planet, as Chomsky calls it. Will it continue? It's hard to see a coherent future, anything like the past we've been known. So for the last thousand years, European culture has been pretty much the same. <coughs> Uh, European and, and derivative cultures, and uh, uh, it's in, like the United States, and, uh, and now it's going to change, but we don't know how. And certainly, there's no great hope for the American government at this time, uh, seeing what's happening to it and uh, certain people. So, um, anyway, I'm 81, so I won't live to see the worst of it, but I don't think things are going to get better. Mythical oracle prophets of prophecy. Mythical oracle prophets of prophecy. Well, there have been so many. First of all, human history is very interesting because we've had language half a million to a million years. That's when the FOXP2 gene seems to have changed into our present form, allowing us to talk. Humans with a defective FOXP2 gene cannot talk. So that's how long language has been on the planet. And I would date humanity from that period, although there were hominids with stone tools all over the world three million years ago. But they were probably grunting and gesturing, like chimpanzees who are very smart and gorillas. But how long have we had agriculture? 10,000 years out of a million. That's just, if, if, this is the, if this is the human history, that's 10,000 years that we've only had agriculture and been able to save up anything. And all those savings, the cities have been repeatedly wasted and destroyed by wars. And so <laughs> all of that is from agricultural, sur agricultural surplus, which I find fascinating. So you're asking about prophets. And, well, we only have records of the last few thousand years. Uh, and writing began about three or 4,000 years ago. And before that, it's all myth, which they tried to get down in the writers. Did you know that the book of Genesis was the last book of the Bible to be written when they were trying to get down all that begat stuff? Well, somebody still remembered it. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the actual past, the actual past of thousands of cultures, thousands of tribes, lost, gone, and dead, which subject to who knows what disasters and bare survivals, <clears throat> managed to get through the world as hunter-gatherers until the agriculture. So for 990,000 years, or, or 490,000 years, there have been speaking people surviving as hunter-gatherers, fishing, I mean, they had stone tools and fish hooks, but they didn't have writing, they didn't have agriculture. So to imagine this past is essentially beyond us. And then for the last 10,000 years, we've been saving up things and wasting them on building cities and destroying them, building cities and destroying them, having wars <coughs> and, and killing all the people. The so-called Alexander the Great, yeah, he, he was sure it was great. Come to a city like Tyre, surrender, be all be killed. Okay, Tyre, no, we don't surrender to Tyre. Okay, kill all killed. That's, that's greatness, isn't it, Alexander? So, uh, 
There have been all these conquerors, but you couldn't have armies before you had agriculture. So thousands of wars of armies based upon agricultural savings in the last 10,000 years. And so few of them do we know about or document. So human history has, has a huge and difficult past. And it, may have, it will have a difficult, but perhaps not huge future. Oh, so you asked about prophets. Well, we, we, we know about the Delphic Oracle. We know about various uh, biblical uh, prophets. My understanding is that there's something called the Jerusalem Syndrome. I read this in a piece in the New Yorker a few years ago. When somebody gets to, comes to Jerusalem and suddenly believes they're a prophet and starts on street corners spewing all kinds of predictions and, 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 uh, and imprecations and, and, uh, and stuff. And that's... Uh, it's, it's, uh, so everybody wants to be a prophet, right? <laughs> like in Hollywood, everybody wants to direct. And so uh, uh, on the street corner, here are all these prophets of old. But the prophets of old, well, some of them got listeners and some of them didn't. The Delphic Oracles had a, a, in Greece had a, had a franchise. So you come, went to the Oracle and they would say something that you could maybe interpret this way or maybe interpret it that way, like a good uh, fortune teller today. And, uh, and so there have been many different prophets, but uh, who could foresee today from long ago? And isn't it the book of Revelations that's the worst with the, with the, uh, uh, the number of the beasts? And, and it's disputed whether that's really 666 or not. <clears throat> but but uh, some, some awfulness is going to happen. Well, maybe right. Uh, but uh, there are many prophets, some are in the Bible, some are not. Some are, most, are not, most are not documented, no doubt. So, uh, if, uh, as Shakespeare says, all the world is stage, are the prophets the directors? No. No, all the world is, all the world's a stage. All the men and women merely play. They have their exits and their entrances, and some among us play many parts. Yeah, so there's no directors. There are those who, who can make decisions at given times, often those with resources like money and army and government. Uh, but uh, what happens is the interplay of so many decisions, so many initiatives, so many, so many uh, attempts at self-defense, so many so many different decisions that uh, there's, there's nobody directing. There's only, uh, there's only the, shall we say, fairly consistent chaos of life. Now, there's, there are a few people who do extraordinary things, like, for example, Henry VIII. Henry VIII did so many bizarre things, like, shutting down the monasteries, beheading his wife, whom he had courted so, so, so assiduously so he could marry somebody else, uh, uh, building in huge castles. Uh, uh, any, anyway, Henry VIII was, 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 was remarkable in the number of bizarre initiatives, but uh, most monarchs are more constrained by money, War on the frontiers, diplomatic threats, trying to marry somebody in another royal family. Uh, that's how it was back in the era of kings. Uh, Shakespeare said, heavy hangs the head, but where's the crown? <laughs> you see, <clears throat> little girls running around, they buy princess hats at, at Disneyland and say, oh, I'm... I'm a princess. I'm not being a princess. You know what real princesses did? They got up at four in the morning to study languages, fencing, and, and, and Latin and rhetoric and, 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 uh, and statecraft. So real princes, real princesses had a lot of work to do. As did real princes. I find this extremely interesting because of our uh, peculiar stereotypes of royalty. Royalty just sitting around doing nothing. Hell no, they got a lot of decisions to make to try to hang on to everything. Thank you.
was given to apprenticeship. The apprenticeship. Well, the apprenticeship model was very good when there were well-defined trades and crafts. So that if you wanted to be a silversmith, you would place yourself as a silversmith. If you wanted to be a, 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 a carpenter or a uh, woodworker, you would apprentice yourself. And, 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 and you had uh, uh, secret handshakes on the trade that should have gotten to a certain level. Why did you have secret handshakes? Because of the of the tendency to steal a trade, which means that you would learn enough as an apprentice to go and claim that you were officially a member of that profession where you had not put in all the years you were supposed to. So apprenticeship worked when there were well-defined trades. But now what are the well-defined trades? We've lost them. The, 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 the tradesmanship, the, 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 uh, the economies that we had back in the <clears throat> the ecologies of, of small towns that we had in the United States 50 years ago, 20 years ago, have all gone because now we have the giant stores and no more small retail outlets. We have the, the, the uh, uh, everything owned by big corporations and, and very few opportunities for a small business. And, uh, and so, so the whole country's been hollowed out. And, and, and there's, no, there's no apprenticeship because... What? Who knows something that you know you'll be able to use as a as a profession ten years from now? There's no there's no certainty. Uh, supposedly, programming, and if you know the Unix command line and and all that flows therefrom, that's a good start. But that's about uh, that's about the only thing I can think of that looks as though it's going to be it's going to last. It's a trade. So apprenticeship, no. There was, in France, they had the compagnon. The compagnon were woodworkers, and they went about the country. And uh, when they completed the whole circuit of France, they were, they were qualified to be fine cabinet makers. So it was a, it was a wonderful model while it worked. And, uh, but, uh, we don't have blacksmiths anymore. We, got, we don't have hardware stores anymore. What? Okay. Say it. So I've enjoyed this. <clears throat> Thanks, anyone. Delicious.